everyone, Melissa Lowe with you, and I am moderating tonight. I would like for you to hover over your screen, and if you see at the bottom, you'll see a toolbar come up, and you'll see chat icons with the letters Q&A. If you have any questions throughout the hour, you can pop your questions here, and at the Q&A time, then I will be reading those out to Sandy for him to answer. Thank you very much, Melissa. We're fortunate this evening to be hearing from a darn nice guy, Sandy Reed. Sandy is not only the president and co-founder of Regan Innovations, he's also the curator of the International Skydiving Museum, which will soon be creating a presence in the Central Florida area. He's the president and co-founder along with, importantly, his wife, Brenda Reed, uh, he, which in the, the Regan Innovations organization will soon be a part of SunPath products. Sandy is the designer of all of the rigging innovation rigs that the company has produced since 1985. And by his estimation, that exceeds 18,000 rigs. Sandy's a private pilot and a skydiver. He started skydiving in 1970, and soon after that, in 1971, became a rigger. And it's of note that his training to become a rigger and his certification was orchestrated by two future members of the Hall of Fame, Ted Strong and Dan Pointer. Sandy accumulated over 4,300 jumps in his jumping career. He was a competitor in four-way, 10-way, and eight-way. In 1979, he earned a bronze medal at the World Meet in France as a member of the South African team. Far and away, Sandy's most substantial and significant accomplishment since becoming a skydiver was convincing his beautiful young wife, Brenda, whom he met in 1976 while in South Africa, to become his wife. And with that, we're going to transition the microphone for a moment and turn it over to Sandy. Uh, good evening, everyone. As he said, I'm Sandy Reed. I'm the president of Rig Innovations, and I'm the designer of the rigs that you're going to be seeing tonight. Um, over the years, I started primarily in 1975. I was doing some really interesting stuff prior to that, but I have the very first rig that I designed and jumped and has some very interesting uh, features. And we'll end up uh, in 2020 with uh, the curb, which is our latest one. So I picked five out of the ones. I have a number of them that I've done, some of them one-off rigs. And, but my favorite one is the first one because when I show you what we've got, um, you'll see what we're, uh, what we're talking about. Oh, so let's take this little baby right here. One of the things that uh, we came up with, Jim asked me about a name and I had no name. I've never had a name for this in all the years since then. So I gave it the designation HD, or DHD number one, double hand deployed number one. And uh, after uh, I'd been on the beach nuts in the uh, mid seventies or so, went on the road with my uh, van, came back to Michigan and spent the winter and I needed a project. And a friend of mine, Jim Taffarelli and I came up with some ideas on uh, a rig that we, uh, we think we might be interested in building. It all started with looking at one of the very first wonder hogs that had a hand to play on it. And that was a radical departure from everything that we had done before. So I looked at it and said, that's a pretty good idea. And uh, if it'll work on the main, why shouldn't it work on the reserve? So we started analyzing it and going over and said, there's some other things that maybe we could change as well. Uh, one of the things that of note was the uh, belly band. And by the time we, we had seen it, there already had some instances with twisted belly bands and things. We said, well, maybe there's another way to do that as well. So I'm going to point out some of the features on this first to explain what they are. And then we'll, we'll see if they still work and uh, everything. You can see what, uh, what we have on this. But this was, uh, there's only three of these made. And I put this one right here. If you look at it, it says custom by Sandy Reed. It's my, at back in the day when I was 26 or 27 years old or something. I don't know. So anyway, let's start out with the, uh, the back end of this. And uh, we have the, uh, the main uh, deployment that we have. Uh, Bill had a uh, elastic uh, loop that he used with the bridle to hold his shit. And I, I didn't particularly like that. I said it, it, there, you had to have a, a flap that held it to keep it from going. So we decided we needed a solid, a solid pin of some sort. So we came up with this. And I have many times referred to it as the world's first curved pin. Um, if you can see it uh, fairly closely, those of you may recognize 
a similarity with something out there. Um, we bought this at the uh, parachute hardware section of the local hardware store, and uh, it seemed to work out well. And what it is is actually a locking uh, pin for a screen door. You know, the other one that has the little thing with the hook on it? Well, it had the eye, it had a curve to it, and we chopped off the end, and it worked out very well. So what it did, it, when, it, when you pulled it, it actually oriented itself, and it would come up and rotate just like the curved pins of today. And I'd never seen one before, so right now I'm going to claim it, and if you if you dispute it, let me know. So that was the first thing we did on that. The other one was, um, as I mentioned before, putting the hand deploy on the belly band didn't seem like a real good idea. So I said, well, where else would it go? And we thought, well, the obvious place is to put it on the bottom of the container. Everything fits and uh, works very nicely. So we did. And as far as I know, this is the first BOC that I've ever seen on there too. Now, one of the things, Jim was a rather ingenious guy, and uh, he started playing with it, and we put a handle on the bottom. This one happens to have a snap. We didn't, we didn't like the Velcro in it. We wanted to keep away from it. But he has this little thing, and I call it the world's first monkey fist out there. Uh, we're just playing with uh, the tubular nylon. There's a lot of tubular on here, and that uh, just snaps onto here. <clears throat> Stays in place. Um, had a couple interesting things to go with that. So that was the uh, the main that we had. So then we went to the reserve and said, okay, now this has different operating parameters that we need. And the idea of the elastic loop is what we wanted to stick with because we wanted a pin. We wanted a straight pin so that because you, when you pull it, you're going to pull it straight out and uh, it would pull the pin at that time. So the elastic would allow it to pivot and it kept it locked in. And the pilot chute is located at the top of the reserve, it's up here, and it's a right hand deploy. I'm right handed, most people are right handed, put it on. I couldn't figure out a way to be ambidextrous and do both of them. You can put one back here and maybe do this, well that didn't work either. So we went with that and what we have is the opening is right here that uh, we have to pull it out and the rip cord is this device right here. So again, Jim comes to the rescue. We have a handle. It's got a knot on the end, does that, and you can pull it on out and it'll go from there. Now, a couple other interesting things. Uh, the first Wonder Hog we had, at, at state of the art at the time, had cape walls on it. And one of the things that we wanted to do is get away from cape walls and come up with some other kind of a release. Uh, to my recollection, Bill was working with the booth wells, what we had. I had a set of those at one time, but uh, it was long before the three ring. So this is what we call the slip away system, which is rather good. So now we're going to start taking a few things apart. So what we have is we have this, which is the cover that goes in it. And there's a knot that you grab. I'm just going to open this a bit to show you. So what you have on the inside is this locks it and keeps it held in place. We have a reefing ring, which was rather interesting. And a number of years ago, Bill Booth is out here busy. And I showed it to him and he looked at it and couldn't believe that we actually use the reefing ring as the load bearing ring on the harness. So what it does, you take a, a slip knot and you put it in and you put this pin through there and that locks it in place. And then this the snap is up here. So this is another piece of hardware which is from the parachute section of the hardware store. And it's actually a clevis pin that you use like with a tractor where you have stuff. It has the, the shoulder, the hole, the shaft and everything. We just ground it down and it worked perfect for what we wanted it to do. So we're gonna pull a couple things on here. So the cutaway, you, you grab it, you pull this down and in this case here, you're going to slide it. And I, what I found is when I started jumping it, I had to reset this every time because if it started to stretch, the distance got shorter and shorter here and you couldn't pull the pin where it'd pull out of the knot. So anyway, so it comes down, this comes out like this, you pull it, here's your the slip knot, comes out and you've got this like that. Okay, now the interesting thing about it, being a Boy Scout, I knew how to tie knots, but there's actually three ways to do the knot here and only one of them works. So you have to know what you're doing on this. So anyway, when you're doing intentional cutaways, we'd go out there and do the, do the cutaway, do a little swing, do a back loop, and then throw out the reserve. We, we were having fun. You know, it comes down to the fact that at that time, we had ideas, but we didn't know what we didn't know. So everything was fair game as to what we thought we could do out there. But uh, I took this one with me to South Africa in 1976 and uh, jumped to put about 250 jumps on it. Had one real high speed malfunction, which was a real heart thumper. And there's, there's a long story better told over a beer on that. But it did work at that point. So anyway, but a, a, a 
post uh, postscript to this thing. When I jumped it with the South African team, Richard Charter, who was the uh, uh, general manager of uh, PISA, did not like this. He thought it was a very bad influence on people because they would want one, and he didn't think it was worth a hoot, which is probably good. So at the World Meet in 1976, when I jumped with the Smirnoff team, the South African team, unknowns to me, he bought one of the original uh, Wonder Hogs from the US team with a three ring release on it. So when we got back to Joburg, he calls me in his office, he says, I have a deal for you. He says, if you stop jumping that piece of crap that you're jumping, I'll give you this. And he reached behind me, pulls out this Wonder Hog and it was like brand new from, from just after the meet. I looked at it and I grabbed it and I said, you have a deal. So I, I recognized the superiority of the, uh, of the Wonder Hog at that time and uh, retired us from that. I put the canopies in the Wonder Hog and everything and I kept this and this is my uh, pride and pride. Oh, you want, oh, you want to, <laughs> okay, uh, there's a story here, okay? So what we have, the pilot chute, okay, you got to pull it out, dun, 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 dun. okay, up here, and then we pull it up, oh, don't do this at home, okay? The reason we laugh and Jim's laughing is when we put this in here, I had to tug it about four times to get the pin pulled out because it hadn't been undone for a while. So anyway, there's your, uh, that one on there, and the, uh, Reserve, you take it, you pull it out to the side, pull it out, take this thing, throw it out, and uh, away it goes at that point. So um, it worked, and I'm still alive, so it's a, it makes a hell of a story. Now, we chose these rigs that we have here because there are various timelines within my uh, developmental history that we have. <clears throat> so that was from the winter of 75, 76. So during that time afterwards, I was working for, uh, for PISA in the late 70s. And then I came back to the States, worked for Bill Booth for a while, ended up working for Dean Westgard, and then decided I can build my own rig out there. And Brenda really encouraged me to do so. So the next one was this one here. This is the original first Talon one that I would actually show people. I have one that is so ugly, even I kind of choke on it when I look at it. But anyway, the, the thing I learned during that time, if you're going to build a product, you have to have it that's it's something people will buy. So you can't be quite as radical as what we had on the hand deploy rig out there. A few will love it and they'll want to jump it, but um, it's liability wise is not so good. So this is very much a combination of various things. We have a, a reserve that really comes out of the uh, vector at the time. Some of the harnesses out of a Centaurus. Um, I changed the shape. Some people would have separate sh uh, flaps that they would have on it. I elected to go in a different direction. You have standard riser covers, they're Velcro. You take a look at the harness on the other side. There's nothing real special about that. Um, change the construction and how it goes together. One little thing of note is that the, the chest strap on here is not a 90 degree angle. It's actually angled up here. I got that from Troy Loney. He worked for me in the about that time in, in uh, 85 when we started this. And I liked it because it, it makes it go like, because your, your harness doesn't go this way, it goes this way. So this comes across that on an angle and it fit great on the thing. So this is more of a conventional uh, rig with everything at that point. Um, a couple, one thing I did as a rigger is that you, when you have Velcro, you have to be able to fix the Velcro. So on this here, this is the reserve flap. I made it so that there's an intern, uh, inside flap here that you sew the Velcro down, then you lay it down, then you stitch around it and it holds together. When it comes time to replace the Velcro, you just undo this, mark it, put it back in, fold it down, worked great. So we had that on there, and we had the same thing on the, on the main, worked very well. So this is pretty much a, a standard rig. It has a rear of leg deployment that, at that point, and nothing uh, real big, but we produced it for about uh, nine years or so, and we sold quite a few of them. So it got the start for rig innovations, put us on the map, and we were selling them to people at that time. No big, big deals on this. Okay, however, now we come to rig number three. Many people may recognize this. It's a Flexon, okay? This I developed in 1992, and after we'd been building the, uh, the town for a while, I had some ideas and I had time to work on things and had quite a, a few things that I thought might work. But one of the things was I wanted to get rid of all the Velcro on a rig. This has come as close as I think we've been anywhere. And the only Velcro that's left on, left on it is on both sides on the main left web for the cutaway handle and for the ripcord. And on the reserve bag, you have uh, Velcro on the pocket that uh, where the, for the line stove pouch and everything. Other than that, there's no uh, Velcro anywhere on this. On it. it has soft housings. 
Um, at this point, I have the reversed risers. We called them integrity risers. We didn't like backward risers. It kind of freaked everybody out. And we did that for a reason because back in the days, there was uh, we were having some failures of risers at various types. Also has an RSL, which has become very popular. People wanted it. This one has a uh, Cypress uh, window on it, but I believe this was retrofitted a little bit later so that uh, we have that. But let me get up here so I can show you what we're doing. Um, so the harness itself, the key thing is that, that this was the original design that we used for the articulator harness. We had uh, the hip ring first, then we went to a chest ring and it went on from there. So that was that part there. The reserve uh, had a molar bag in it, which was unusual. Instead of a, a double bag, we had double layers. It had, actually had it shaped so you could build the molar into it. Uh, the one pin, nothing special on that. But uh, what was interesting, I designed a pilot chute for it, the stealth pilot chute, and we still use the stealth today because it's the best design that I've used and it's worked very well. And we have a lot of people that have used it, they like it, and uh, it's uh, proven itself over time. So that was on the main. Or on the reserve, I should say. So we have the main. Um, we have this here. This is uh, what, uh, the double uh, uh, tab system that we put onto it. And uh, a friend of mine commonly referred to it as the walrus teeth. Got so we have that in there. Said, yeah, okay, it'll work. Um, this has been retrofitted to some longer ones. They had other ones on that, but they work great because they straddle the pin and it keeps it very nice and tight. This also has a rather interesting kill line, one of the early ones. And I used, I folded the uh, material in half and sewed it, but it caused a twist because the thing had a curve to it. And when you threw the potter chute out, it would just wrap up. It was a real pain in the butt, but there was that and it worked well. So the key thing is though, is the, the reserve, uh, the main riser covers in the reserve. What we have here, you have the main, uh, side flaps and then you have this the risers come down and here is the riser cover itself and you'll see it looks like this so yeah and you find that it's angled it's up here and then it's like a trapezoid almost and what it does it fits into this pocket right here you put it in at the top it slides in then you push the bottom in so what you have if from the top if it pulls it can't come out because it's pulling against the force there but on the bottom when the riser comes out it just flips out and away you go there was a small tab on the inside on both sides for the reserve so that that would pop out if you deployed the reserve and everything was clean at that point. So anyway, we probably made about, uh, I think around eight or 900 of these if I'm not mistaken. And they proved very popular. And uh, later on we redesigned it and uh, put regular riser covers on and uh, it became the Talon II and we built thousands of the Talon II. So it's kind of the predecessor at that point. Um, also, one thing about it, it has this fabric called Antron. Some of you people who've been around know of the Antron fabric. That was one of my not very good ideas. We saw it, it looked good. They used it to make uh, golf bags out of it, it really uh, shiny stuff, but it didn't wear very well. And it got real fuzzy after a while. And a friend of ours, and not many people will know, Flip Colmer, uh, jumped one. He came to me and says, I figured out how to solve the problem. He pulls out his uh, Norelco razor and he shaved, they gave the rig a shave and it worked great on the thing. So, and that other people did it too. So there's the Flexon. Now, we're going up to about the year 2000 or so um, that uh, probably, I, I think we started the project in 1999. This was a time when uh, people were starting to do a lot of free flying, vertical uh, jumping. Of types. So we wanted something that was a little more uh, tapered and, and contoured, so we had this, so it was actually looked like this shape. So when, particularly when you're standing or you're sitting uh, with the curve, instead of having a box down here, you don't have as much uh, uh, buffering on a thing, and it was much smoother. It worked out very well. Um, one of the interesting things when we first uh, designed it, we thought we'd put the bag in upside down, put the lines over here in the bottom, and it worked well, but everybody, they couldn't figure it out that you had to do that. It was only a cosmetic thing that we had. But uh, anyway, this was the, uh, the successor to the other ones. We have the same reserve that we had on the, uh, on the uh, Flexon, except we cleaned it up. It's gone to standard riser covers. This is uh, just regular tuck tabs that we have. And uh, we changed the closing method down here, went to the upward closing flap, which has become very common in today's uh, uh, sport out there. It worked really well. It had a re and rather interesting logo on here. And people say, where did the logo come from? Well, I'm not gonna tell you the real details because it would involve the French. And anytime you get the French involved, then you're gonna be embarrassed at one point or another. But what it turned out to be 
was in the computer. I had two uh, curves on here, and I put them together, and they came out like that. So we called it the voodoo eye. And uh, people call it other things, too. So we'll let that one go. The key thing is, is that by now, we had a pretty mature design on the harness itself with the uh, multiflex harness and the leg straps and everything we put into it. And of course, the AEDs were standard at that time. So this, again, this is one of my personal ones. It says Dr. Voodoo, that was my, uh, what do you call it, avatar? Okay, so anyway, I keep this one here too. And the, the colors, I like. that's my personal colors. And the last of, the, of this batch, and this is my favorite one though. That's when I, I like the, the first one out there, but this is probably the best rig that I've designed yet uh, for a number of reasons. And it's really the culmination of what I've done with everything. And it turns out that what I've done here on the curve was what I was trying to do on the Voodoo, but there was, I didn't have the technology. One of the things that was necessary to make certain things is the reduction in volume of the canopies. You know, the only secret to small rigs is small canopies. So at the end of the uh, uh, 1990s, the trend was into smaller canopies, ZP, uh, Spectraline, all the little things like that. And we got into some really nice reserves that they had out here that packed well. So now that we have the optimums and others that work, it works very well on this. Gives us a good balance between them. So the harness, again, is fairly uh, similar to what the the uh, Flexon was, or the, yeah, the Voodoo, I should say, but there's a different leg strap on here. And what this does, you'll see as it comes down, it's offset and then it goes down here. So what it does, it brings the leg strap a little forward, a little more comfortable, it's easier riding in there. It works very, very well on there. We've done quite a bit of upgrades and changing dimensionally on it, but the basic uh, design is in there. Um, okay, we got that. This has magnetic riser covers, that's become all the rage in recent years. And uh, these are really nice. They're some of the best that we've done. We've solved a lot of problems. You'll see that has. An interesting thing about it, you'll notice when I do this, this actually has a hinge to it. This is one of a few secrets. One of my good friendly competitors asked, I want to hear all your secrets. I said, I don't have any secrets, but maybe this is one of them. But anyway, it's designed so that the hinge in there, it just flops it down and it holds most of it. And this just keeps it closed at that time. If you in the beginning, we had it the way we built it. It was really hard to get back over there and it wouldn't stay in position. So we, re we solved the problem and it works out very, very well. Okay, I got that. The reserve again is still common. We have the same type of reserve bag, same pilot chute that we had before. Um, does a little bit different as far as how we close it. We got the two flaps on here. And uh, one of the things that we have on this is we have a tab that is a derivative of the same tab that Bill Booth had on the Sigma. And when I saw that years ago, I thought that is one of the slickest things I've ever seen. And, but how could I use it outside of perhaps the, uh, the tandem environment? I wasn't interested in doing the uh, environment, or the tandem. So, but what I found in playing with it, that by using them, instead of stacking everything up, you have it like this. So you effectively remove one layer of flaps when you have a four flap reserve or a four flap main on there. And that one layer makes a major difference in the smoothness of how the rig packs and everything goes together. So it worked on that. So we did that for a number of years. And once we proved it, we went and we have the tab down here on the, uh, on the reserve. It does really well on here because this is really tight for it to hold in and solves any problems with the flaps coming open on that. We have a new piece of hardware now. It's a solid one that we've been using for quite some time. And it replaces the, uh, the wire tab that we have. Okay, so. Um, the other things that, the big ones that we had though, is the shaping of the rig. And I developed uh, the technique on some, another project that I was working on. And you can see this is actually contoured. So this fits into the small of the back. If you look at any rig out there, um, whether it's in the air or on the ground, and the, back, the human back has a contour. Some of them very radical, some of them a little more straight. So they want to fill it in. What I kept looking at, I said, there's dead space back there. It's not being used. So I created this and it worked right from the get go. It was perfect. So all I had to do is refine the dimensions that I was using but you, it's a completely different construction method on there because it's multiple pieces instead of just one. If you look at our talon, you lay it out, the, main, the whole container has the reserve, the main side flaps, you put them on. It's just one big piece. You can't build a three-dimensional rig 
out of a two-dimensional piece of fabric kind of thing. You have to do other things in order to do it. So maybe that's given one of the, uh, the secrets away on it. The other thing that we have is this right here. We call it the, the bio yoke, and it's actually a patent uh, feature from Airborne Systems. When I uh, developed the RA-1 uh, military system, that uh, we, as they developed further into it, they came up with the idea. This came from Paraflight, and I have the license on it to use that. And it works really, really well. What it does, it takes the load up off the shoulders. It's more comfortable and it allows the rig to sit just a little bit higher. It doesn't sag down on your, on your butt. And uh, it works very, very well. And I've used it in a number of different applications. A couple other little things we have. We have a built-in uh, uh, attachment here for the uh, slider uh, stow that we use. I like it because it keeps everything on the outside of the reserve flap so it's clean. We put a built-in hook knife into it. And we have a special chest strap, which has a stow right here that it fits into because people use the elastic uh, keepers, they stretch out, they fall off, and then they wrap it around, they tie it in knots, they do all kinds of stuff. But that works really well. At, at first, people are a little bit reluctant, but now they use it, they love it, it works great. Particularly for people that have yard and a half long chest straps, some of the scoopers, whatever they have there. So, I think that's it on, for this. We have one other thing that maybe might uh, say something, it is the Mojo, the MARD system that we have. And uh, I'm putting this out here, although I don't take credit for it. Uh, it was a cooperative effort between the Airborne Systems and ourselves. But Mark Bauer, who's one of our uh, chief instructor for the USAPR, really got his teeth into this and did a lot of the main work on it. Uh, the one that the Airborne has, it looks very, very similar, operates the same way, but it's a little bit bigger, a little more, I would say, robust for the military environment. Uh, Mark was able to miniaturize it and work, and it works great. It's the simplest system that I have seen yet. And to, as far as I know, we haven't had any issues out there. Nobody's had a problem. And most of the rigs that we're building today, they get the mojo on it. So. And the nice thing about it, there's no modifications needed to the harness and container. All you do is you get the new reserve bag that has the, the bridle and the mojo on it, and you get the RSL with the additional lanyard, pack it up, and you're ready to go. So, Sandy, we had a couple of questions about the TSO. I'm going to read two different questions. One is from Pat Thomas and then a gentleman named Larry. Larry asked if you can briefly describe the TSO process you had to go through for each reg. And Pat Thomas chimed in. She also said Sandy is the only one of two companies that has tested to TSO C23F. And she wanted to know which rigs were certified under which TSO. Okay. Uh, it's actually a very good uh, question, particularly for people from outside the US that are, are not real familiar with the TSO system. The TSO stands for Technical Standard Order. And it applies not only to parachutes, but to all kinds of aviation uh, components. If you take an airplane and you take away the airframe and the engine, everything else on it, tires, radios, seats, seat belts, all this stuff, has to meet some kind of a, perform a performance standard. Now, a TSO is actually two parts that you have on there. The first part is actually the design approval. In other words, you come up with something, harness a container, and there's a certain uh, number of uh, tests that you have to do, live jumps, dummy jumps, whatever, there may be some environmental tests that go with it. Uh, you have to go through all that and prove that it meets the minimum. And right now, um, if you have, without a, a MARD, because MARD has, add, uh, adds about 26 jumps to the, the system, you're somewhere around 75 to 80 jumps, because you can, in some cases, double up doing two things on one jump, like a, an opening and a rate of descent test, you can do it on the same, uh, uh, jump. So you have that. That's the design approval. So you have to have all the technical specs and it says what it is. The second one though and to the FAA is that it's probably the most important is what they call the production approval. And that it's a, you have to have a QC system or a QA, it might be another way to put it, to show that you can take that design and you, say you've tested, you've tested one and you're going out there and it meets everything. The FAA wants to know you can build a thousand of them or a million of them to the same drawing and you can expect that it will operate and function and, and do the same thing that you did with that first one that was tested. If you make any changes, they have what they call main, major and minor changes. And uh, they say it's kind of an interesting one. They say, well, uh, what is a major change? Well, the major change is anything that uh, affects the fit, form, and function out there that you have. 
And uh, the minor change is anything that's not a major change. So that's kind of an interesting thing that the FAA puts into it. So over the time, during the course of the year or whatever, you can do minor changes. And every, every now and again, you submit it to the FAA, and they stamp them, put them in the file, and away you go. But if there's anything that changes the fit, form, and function, uh, then you have to do a complete retest on that. Now, having said that, when we started in 1985, I, I certified to C23C uh, category B. Uh, that would have just changed from the old C23B from way back in the 40s and through the 50s and into the 60s at that point. So we certified to that. As we went along later, um, in the mid-90s, I had our aviator system, and we certified to D at that time. It was the one that was in there. Now we are we are uh, changed everything and upgraded all the products that we're building to C23F. And F is considerably more stringent than any of the ones that are out there before. The testing that they require, the number of tests, the type of test, um, everything is a lot more than what we had. It used to be in the old days when we had the, the talent out there. I remember doing the stuff. We'd had, we had a set of meters and the binoculars, and they'd go out and do a jump. And you have a stopwatch, and you had to, you had to open in 303 seconds, or they had a, a rate of, or a, altitude loss that you could do, but nobody had the instrumentation to measure altitude loss. So it was always by opening time. So we go out, click, look at it, ah, 2.5. Okay, good, that's a good jump. It opened, you lived, and it was within the time. That was the standard that you were working to at that time. And over the years, it's gotten much more stringent. Now you have all the different kinds of instrumentations. Uh, you have load cells, everything. And when we did the, uh, the, the TSO for the, uh, the curve for C23F, um, in many cases, we would have used uh, altitude loss because with the, all the stuff we have, it's amazing what it can do. And although I consider myself somewhat of a parachute engineer because of what I do for the design, um, I'm not the engineer that some of the other people that are out there that have the degrees and have all the background and it works out very well. So that's the, the difference that we would have between the different uh, TSOs, there's different performance standards. Um, when we did the, the uh, talent, it was rated at uh, uh, 300 pounds at 150 knots. Um, we had about the same thing with uh, D, but there were some other tests that you had to throw into it. But now under, under C23F, we've taken it up. So we're now rated to 325 pounds. We've gone 75 pounds higher than we had before. We still keep the 150 knots at this particular point. It's a matter of juggling. You pick out what you want to be certified, and then there's a mathematical formula, 1.5, that you multiply it by, and it'll tell you what you have to test to at that time. Um, right now, as far as I know, there's only two uh, manufacturers that have C23F. We have ourselves and Strong Enterprises have it on their, their latest uh, tandem systems that they do. Um, so does that answer the question? Yeah, so incredible. Well, thank you, Sandy. Scott Latness from Spaceland Houston asks, you developed the BOC in the 70s. We use the BOC now. Why did it go out of favor and then come back? Now you said you developed the BOC in the 70s. Okay, it came up with it. Um, I don't think it ever came out of, uh, went out of favor because that we had at the time uh, when I designed this one, which had the, the BLC on it, and there may have been others that were involved in it, um, it took a while for it to catch on. And it was kind of, I think that what we had was that it had a comparison to the, the pullout pilot chute. Um, which they had on the racers and others. And uh, that was not a very popular. It was popular at the time, but there was, in some places, I think in Australia, you had to have a D license in order to jump a pullout. And other places, it's similar. They just thought it was dangerous. And I think what happened is the BOC kind of got uh, painted with the same brush, so to speak, and I went from there. But what we found is that now, uh, the people have it because of the vert the VRW is the biggest thing out there. It's more secure. They have the free fly handles that hold the, the PUD in place and it works very, very well. What was rather interesting is that when I built the uh, hand deploy rig out there, people kind of look at it and they're going, ah. I said, look, if you can find your wallet, scratch your butt, you can find your BLC and it works just fine. And they go, that makes perfect sense out there. And it, it started taking off after a while. So I think it's uh, probably that's the best answer I can give for that. Thank you, Sandy. Alan Banfield asks, would you like to talk about the spring hog you built in South Africa? 
Here's a spring hog. I didn't put this one on here because uh, we didn't have enough time for it, but I'll keep it real brief. Um, after I had the double hand deploy rig, um, when I worked for PISA, they, they had originally gotten a, they copied the piglet uh, harness container in 1974 at the World Meet uh, when uh, the people down there uh, jumping in South Africa. And it worked, but it was really a klutzy rig. It was big, it was kind of bulky, and not very streamlined on that. So one of the jobs that uh, Richard gave me, he said, we need a new harness and container. So with my, experience, my vast experience of uh, six years as a rigger, or whatever the case may be, I took this, I looked at it, and I was jumping the Wonder Hog so I could, I could see what that is, and came up with a rig that's, again, still more conventional, but a lot cleaner. It has a double uh, pin system, which we had. Uh, had an interesting thing. There was a Teflon lined uh, channel in here that this went through. And uh, with that, uh, how's that? And uh, so we had that. This one had a pullout at one time. Right now it, it was on the side and it was taken off. Um, but other than that, it's fairly standard. Basic harness. This is a step in. It's got the, uh, the three ring. Nothing untoward that would be unusual at that point. Um, what we wanted this thing for at the time that uh, Pisa was building a really nice 26 low pole reserve and they built a canopy, a 27 foot conical canopy for around, they call it the spear chucker, which was a great name out there. It's a long story on that. And you could buy the whole rig for probably around 1100 Rand or whatever it was at the time. And the Rand actually had some value back in those days, but it turned out that the size on most of them would fit the squares. And in the, in the late seventies, uh, when I came up there with the uh, Stratostar in 76, and then they had the, uh, the first, they had the cruise air that came, they had the units, the cruise light, the strato cloud, all the various ones that uh, came along. So we were able to take the same size and make it just uh, a little bit bigger and it worked. And they sold hundreds of these things. It was great. It really brought the, the South African uh, jumpers into the, uh, the latest regime. It worked great. <clears throat> this one has an interesting story. When I left uh, South Africa, I sold it. This was the last one that I was jumping on the team. Uh, I figured I'd get a new rig back when I came back to the States and sold it. And uh, years later, I started hunting around for it. And I said, I wanted to find the rig. It was the missing piece of my design history. So uh, I was talking, I was up at Lost Prairie at the Boogie and there was a guy from South Africa. I told him about it. And he says, I know where it's at. A friend of mine has it. I said, I'll tell you what, you tell him, I will give him a brand new rig, Talon, in exchange for this rig. He says, I'll get back to you. So about six months later, he calls me up. He says, I have your rig. Does the offer still stand? I said, yeah. So he sent me the rig. I sent him an order form. Little did I know, this is what I found, all his friends found out, the guy that had, had, had the rig gave it to him because he gave him a story, didn't tell him what the deal was. He got the new rig, and then later the guy found out, and it all came back, and everybody in South there, they were haw-hawing about this whole thing, so it was kind of funny. But uh, it all worked out in the end because the guy had quit jumping, so he didn't have a need for it at that time. So, what else? Awesome. Pat Thomas asks, what does, or where does the word mojo come from? Mojo. Oh. You know what? Uh, one thing about uh, names, I'm going to digress just a little bit, because one of the big things in the parachute industry, in any industry, I think, you can have a really good product, but if you have a crappy name, you're going to be fighting an uphill battle up there. And there's been a couple of those in the parachute industry that weren't real good. Um, so you have to look at it. And we've had, uh, right from the beginning, when we had the talent, uh, I had a set of guidelines and said, here's the things we don't, we want or we don't want on the thing. One of them, I wanted to keep it short, preferably uh, two syllables, talon or talon, as some people call it, have out that. Um, you want it, uh, if it's representative of something, the talon is the claw of a, of, a, of a hawk or an eagle or everything, so that worked out well. Um, you want it a, a name that people can pronounce, particularly non-English speakers, that they, uh, if they are looking at it. And the last thing is you don't want a name that in another language means something that you don't want to know about on the thing. And that's happened a couple times out there, so you always have to do that. So we've used that concept all the way through the years, and I have to think that we have some really good names. The Talon was a good one out there. Um, we had the Flexon, uh, was excellent because we, it uh, was the flexible thing that came out, we looked at everything when we were doing a trademark search on it. And then we had the, uh, the Voodoo, uh, that one came up great. And a little story was Bill Booth came out here and uh, he was uh, looking at it and he made a comment. He says, you know, I thought we had all the good names that began with V. I said, well, what can I say, Bill? 
at that point. So we had that. And then the curve has been great. It's actually the perfect one for what we're doing with that. Um, another one is the CPX, which is our uh, classic uh, rig they have. People say, what does it stand for? Well, it's just, it could be. Our original accuracy rig was the, the Talon Classic. Then we had the Classic Pro, the Classic Pro 3.0. So we said, Classic Pro, extreme. Not that. We just use the letters and it's worked perfect out there. Anybody can say CPX, they can see what it looks like and it works out great. The mojo. Uh, oh, back to the, the question. How do we get the mojo? Um, we had we had to work long and hard on coming up with the name the mojo, and uh, we had a couple of things. And, and being having spent time in Africa, there's a few African names that they have out there, like juju. You have good juju and bad juju out there, as far as uh, luck or uh, magic or something like that. And uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head what the mojo actually has, but it's actually a very positive connotation. It isn't a negative one. And uh, it was interesting. So I started thinking about it. And then I remembered, I said, there was a mojo canopy that uh, was uh, built one time. And it turned out to be, it was a crew canopy. It was built by uh, uh, Adam Filipino, I think up in Northern California, if I'm not mistaken. So I was talking to Bill Gargano one day. And he says, oh yeah, he says, Here's his phone number. He gave it to us. So I called him up and said, Adam, I'd like to use this name Mojo, and here's what we're doing. And he says, great. And he says, and he says, it worked really well. It was a very popular rig. He says it opened great, it flew great, it landed like shit. He says, okay. But he says the name stuck and it, it had a good connotation. So feel free to use it. So we've done that. And we're uh, working on the uh, trademark for that. So we'll have that. So that's where the, the mojo came from. But it, it's something to do with the uh, with voodoo, black magic type of thing, but it's in a positive thing. If you have good mojo, bad mojo. On the thing. Awesome. So Philip asks, did you have to modify something for rigs which were going to be used mostly by base jumpers? Um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting, when we built the pilot rig, the aviator, everybody thought it was a base rig because it was a single, pi a single parachute system, and uh, we had that. Um, probably the biggest thing that I would look at, you'd have to make sure you have open corners on the bottom, much as wing suitors, that they have theirs open, and you want to have probably a pretty good sized pilot chute that's going to work for that. I don't do base jumping, but I have a lot of friends that do. Um, I've never looked at building them. I always look at let, let that particular part of jumping to the people that are the experts. If you're not working with it, uh, then don't play with it. Um, I do have one thing I'd like to pass along though, but uh, with the exception of the curve, at this point, I have always done the first jumps on every rig that we have uh, built over the years. And when he got to the point that uh, it was time to do the jumps on the curve, I've been having back problems for quite some time and I elected not to do it. And when the first jump was one of our dummies that went on there. And then we had, I don't know who actually did the first live jump on it. So it's always been one of the things. It's one of those things I learned from Ted Strong uh, a long time ago. He was my real, my mentor and uh, role model out there. And I uh, learned a lot from him. He always did that. He would do the first jumps on all of this stuff. So. That's awesome. Anything, anything well, else? Yeah, we got a couple more. Kirk Knight asks, the curve main handle has a tab on the handle that tucks into the side flap. Is that tuck tab exclusive to RI? And how did you design that option? Uh-oh. Let's say that one again. I'm looking at something here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yep, so the curved main handle has a tuck tab, has a tab on the handle oh. that tucks into the side flap. Yeah, it's the free fly handle. Um, actually, that came about uh, somewhere along the line. It's been out there for quite some time. Uh, one of the things that when Jim and I were talking about getting the outline here, um, we had a thing that says, um, what I've done over the years has been an innovator and an integrator. And I have to say that not all the good ideas that have I come up with, there's a lot of things that are suggested by other people, but I've made them work and put them into production and it's worked out very well. I try to give uh, credit where credit is due. Uh, and I would say that uh, to answer Kirk that uh, this has been around for some time. It's been a very popular option. Um, they just call it a free fly handle. I don't know if it has any other name or not, but, uh, but it works well. Awesome. Next question is weight limits on various TSOs. Oh, oh. So you said 325 pounds. He, you had answered his question right there. So next question: Has rig construction gotten more or less difficult over the years, and how has it benefited from technology? <laughs> 
That is a great question. Um, and the reason I say that is that for a long time, um, I thought that our rigs were one of the most rigor friendly rigs out there, not only to pack, but also to work on. Um, I mean, there's a story that I heard years ago about uh, there was an automotive engineer that was uh, designing a car and he was not a mechanic. And so in order to change the oil filter, he had to pull the engine out of the car to change the oil filter because he wasn't thinking like a mechanic, he was thinking like an engineer. Um, so I've tried to adhere to, to get away from that. And as a rigger, uh, I go out and try to make it so it's easy to work on. The curve is considerably more uh, complex. It's harder for uh, repairs to do. It takes a very skilled individual to, uh, to work on this and everything. We try to help people as much as possible. But nowadays there's a lot of riggers out there. They may be riggers, but they're more like glorified packers, so to speak. They don't get into the real nuts and bolts, but there are some really good ones out there that uh, do have the experience. And I'd like to help them as much as possible to be able to, to work on this. But um, you can replace some of the flaps. You can buy the flaps and put them on, but to construct them, it's pretty doggone hard. So on uh, this one, it is considerably more complex. But uh, I have other ideas on, on there and how to, uh, to approach it from another uh, direction. And it's one of the things that with our uh, uh, sale to uh, SunPath and everything, it'll allow me to work as an engineer and let the other people do the administrative part and the production and the sales and everything. And I can sit in the back room and just putter away and have a fine time because I still have a lot of ideas. And the, the, the engineering crew at SunPath is really a bunch of good people and I'm looking forward to it. And uh, you haven't seen the end of uh, what I can do or a lot of the other people do, but I think they chose me because I'm the old guy. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to provide them with some of the, the prevent some of the um, stoppage uh, or the roadblocks that I ran into before. And there's a lot of things that uh, we tried years ago that didn't work, but now we have different parameters. We have different materials. We have lighter stuff, whatever it may happens to be, and you can make it work. And it worked out, very, it can work out very well like that. So there's a lot of things that we tried that didn't work that may work now and go back and revisit it. But there's so much new stuff out there as far as materials and techniques. Um, 3D modeling, all kinds of things that uh, I'm looking forward to working with out there. And I, one of the things is my the, ad, the CAD system I've been working with is uh, I started in 1994, and uh, now I have to learn AutoCAD. So for those of you that are familiar with AutoCAD, um, I have to work with that. But it's it's going to be fun. It's uh, there's not a lot of big uh, differences, but uh, it's the old dog do tricks thing that I think that's going to be interesting. So awesome. What else? Another question from Nigel Brennan. Is the mojo available for small talents? Yes. Uh, when well, you say small talents, you know, we have uh, three or four versions of the talent. If you take them down to, uh, you're talking about small, would that be like small canopies, like a sub 100 or something like that? Um, yes, we do it. We make them right across the line. We uh, have set it up to retrofit to the Curve, the CPX, uh, the Telesis 3, Telesis 4.0, and we have the uh, Voodoo because they all have the same RSL configuration on it. And that's very critical so that we only have to replace the lanyard and put a new uh, bag on it. So within those models, we can take them, we run them all the way from the smallest all the way to the biggest. It's not a problem with that. So if they have any questions, just contact us and we'll let you know if you can do that. Awesome, another question. What was your most harebrained idea about a rig? Now say that again. What was your most harebrained idea about a rig? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'd have to define harebrained on the thing. Uh, probably one of them, and this was the, the Antron fabric we used on the Flexon uh, wasn't tested sufficiently to prove its uh, validity on there. It, it looked great, but it, it wore out. But harebrained would be something that didn't work. Um, I, you know, you, I haven't shown the people the things that haven't worked. I have a box full of all kinds of things. I have drawings and every stuff that uh, didn't play out. And if you're not running into dead ends and having failures, you're not trying hard enough to improve the products out there. So it's, you shouldn't be afraid of that. That's just, that's a natural part of it. And uh, out of everything that we've done, you know, I've been very fortunate and very successful, particularly with the latest one with the curve. But I still have some ideas that I think uh, are worth exploring and let's see what comes down the line down there. That's awesome. Well, that's all the questions, but I have a question, Sandy. Is uh -oh. we can, uh, 
<laughs> I, I'm obviously a, a big fan of yours and super inspired by everything that you've done, but I'm just curious on what advice or how would you motivate the next generation of riggers, engineers, or people that are innovating in the sport? You know, that is an excellent question because it's one of the things that we're facing within the Parachute Industry Association. If you look at myself, I'm 72 years old. And I'm one of the young guys in many cases of uh, the original generations out there. We're losing all these people fast. Um, we need a new generation of people to come out there. Um, but it's not something that's easy to get into. They, they, you can get degrees in aeronautical engineering and stuff at like uh, UND or whatever it is uh, for that. But being a good engineer is stuff from the days of the cut and try when I started is long past. There's very few people that would, you'd be able to do that. And you, and you can't design the rigs nowadays. You can't design, you surely can't design canopies without a CAD system and me and working in 3D and having all the aerodynamics and the stuff that goes behind there. So um, for people, if you're, we're looking for that next generation, but I think we're going to have to look uh, further, those people that are advancing more. One of the, the people that I, I'll point out is uh, Storm Dunker. Uh, his name has become very familiar within the industry. Um, he was an uh, engineering student at ASU in about uh, 2001 when I came out with uh, the Voodoo. And uh, he was packing on the weekends and making money so he could jump. And somebody pointed him out to me and said, hey, you need to talk to this guy. So I went and talked to him and came to an agreement where one or two days a week he would come down and work with me. And uh, he really put a lot of the engineering thought processes into it. There's some things that he designed that are still in our rig that, uh, that work well. Anyway, it turns out that when he graduated from ASU, I could no longer afford him. And he went on to work for a bunch of other companies. And he now is based out of Vienna, Austria, has a beautiful wife and two young girls. And he has, he's one of the foremost engineers in the parachute industry today. Uh, and uh, he's the type of person that we have. One of the things I've given some thoughts is to establishing a scholarship for people to study engineering and parachutes, decelerator technology is the, the term they commonly used for people that are out there. There's not very many people that have the innate ability. Um, I do, I will kind of pat myself on the bat that I do have that to a degree that, and I don't know why, I just, it, things come to me. Um, the French crew team come here periodically and they jump our gear. And one of the girls, she, she says, how do you come up with this thing? And I said, I dream about it. And she kind of looked at me, yeah, right. So next year they came back and she says, are you still dreaming about these things? I go, hell yeah. So, you know, and you do, I wake up at times and, and do it. And I know other people that are in the industry do the same thing, but we're a very small group worldwide. I don't think there's more than Oh, if I were to throw a number out there, maybe six or eight good engineers that have been doing this for a long time. So we need another generation out there, and I'm not sure how we get it. Uh, the, one of the things is with SunPath, they have a couple junior engineers that uh, are really whiz kids, and they simply uh, came to SunPath and they met them and they uh, hired them and they were doing some work, and they now they have they're jumping and they know this stuff, and I'm looking forward to working with these people. But those are the types that you want. Um, there's more to it than just the, the cut and try thing, but um, I'm, I'm fairly confident that we're going to see it. We're seeing tremendous uh, evolution in the canopies that are out there. That's the big thing that's going on there, but that doesn't mean that we don't have anything we can do with the harness container. If you think about it, we have a body, we have a torso, two legs, two arms, and a head. So that gives us certain uh, parameters that we have to work with, but not everybody is a clone. They're not the same. Their sizes are different. That is a real uh, uh, challenge in building a rig for the, the big people and little people. The little people are hard because the, the, equi the hardware and webbing doesn't scale. The big people, they're just big and you have to do things up there. But the majority of the people are in the middle. So we have that. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, when I, after I got out of the Marines and I went back to school, I uh, had aspirations of becoming a lawyer and uh, spent about three years at college. I was working nights as a janitor at uh, Western Michigan University and had this harebrained scheme, and that's probably one of the things you might <laughs> talk about, to go on the road with a truck with sewing machines and travel the country and be a roaming rigger and have a good time and hopefully make some money. I had a great time and I went broke at the end of about two years or so. So that was a life lesson that I think a lot of people need to learn. And, uh, and to go from there, so. Awesome, thank you, Sandy. Well, those are all the questions for tonight.
Okay, well, I think at this point, I'd like to thank everybody for participating in here. Again, this is the first of what we hope will be a series out there. Um, we're going to learn a lot from this. If you have any feedback, we'd love to hear you send it to us. Uh, what we can have. I know that uh, Yo Ostevir in, in Holland, he says it's kind of hard at two o'clock in the morning. I have to sit up to listen to you. But we've got the Aussies on the other side that want to, they're doing okay, and we're in the middle. So we'll come up with something that'll work for everybody on the thing. But thank you, everybody. I appreciate you uh, listening to this guy talk.